the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Vasilova and today I want to talk about anarchism and ethics, or the problem of ethics for anarchists. And by ethics I mean two things. First is the rules or norms that guide our behaviour, and second, the big principles on which these rules are based. We could also call the second thing values or meta-ethics. There are books and books of ethical and moral theories which philosophers have developed. But in the university ethics class, we would normally cover the same three. Kantian deontology, or duty-based ethics, which bases right and wrong on universal moral laws, such as don't lie, don't murder, etc. Then we have consequentialism, which says it's the consequences that matter and make an action right or wrong. The most common version of consequentialism is Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, where what matters is that we bring the most happiness to the most people. And finally, we have Aristotelian virtue ethics, which suggests we focus on developing a virtuous or noble character, and all actions that follow will be virtuous too. All of these, and other contemporary ethical theories you might have heard of, such as Levinasian ethics of the other, Lacanian or Derridian ethics based on a master signifier, Neo-Kantian approaches or contemporary teleological approaches, all of these are based on a framework of transcendence. Which is really, philosophy speak, for relying on something external to our lives something which we have to take for granted exists. In deontology, that is an unchanging universal moral law. In teleological ethics, it is the end that justify the means. And in virtue ethics, it is the virtues themselves. I think that anarchism has a big problem with this kind of thinking. I'll go so far as to say anarchism isn't really compatible with transcendent philosophies at all. And that does include most philosophy and virtually all moral philosophy. Let's start with ethics that involve God, since gods are the great examples of transcendent things. Gods tend to be universal, outside of the human world, omnipotent or super powerful, in many ways the very definition of transcendence. One moral framework that the Christian God gives us, for instance, is the Ten Commandments. In a sense, once we have the commandments, the problem of how we should behave is solved because we have the actual ultimate rules. We don't need to think about them and most of what we have to figure out is what is and isn't acceptable according to these rules. Easy maybe. But even if on the outset this looks great, it invites dogmatism blind following of the rules, and ultimately strongly reduces one's capacity to make decisions or even act, such as, for instance, in the example of Abraham. To extend this, any transcendent ethical framework reduces one's capacity to act, and this process of making absolute judgments can create shame, guilt, punishment and strict boundaries, which arbitrarily exclude people. Transcendence calls for a judgment and ultimately for being rigid and dogmatic in issuing that judgment. This might be starting to sound a little familiar to those of you who move in anarchist circles. Anarchists have long rejected coercive morality, although have maybe occasionally struggled to define clearly what is coercive about morality. However, this creates a problem. How should we behave as anarchists? Do we have rules that are not coercive? What does that mean? Can you be an anarchist and eat at McDonald's? Can you be an anarchist and be in government? Can you be an anarchist and 
make everybody else be an anarchist so that we have an anarchist society. Some anarchists might say that you cannot tell anybody else what to do. But does that mean that anarchists accept everything? Some anarchist authors claim that this problem can be overcome by offering ethical blueprints, suggestions, rather than universal moral rules. These blueprints often come in the form of be the change you want to see in the world, such as if you live in an anarchist society, you should act as an anarchist now. I argue that the problem actually runs deeper. It cannot be solved by offering blueprints which are only a suggestion. A disclaimer that the author does not intend something to be coercive does not preclude the possibility of it becoming so. All is well when we talk about big abstract rules such as don't kill your neighbour, but when we look into how these blueprints are applied, we find that they are not so straightforward. For instance, if you want to live in an anarchist society where there is no violence, Should you only do peaceful protesting? If you want to live in an anarchist society where there is no exploitative capitalism, should you stop using money now? These suggestions or soft rules become yet another tool for policing. If you're a real anarchist, you wouldn't be eating at a chain restaurant. If you're a real anarchist, you wouldn't be participating in the system. If you're a real anarchist, you would wear black. This happens, I argue, not because the blueprints or the suggestions or moral frameworks are wrong per se, but because they rely on transcendent principles, on something grounding them externally. If suggestions and blueprints still rely on transcendent principles, they ultimately create the same problem for anarchist politics as strict moral rules do. In other words, Forcing someone to follow a set of rules has more or less the same effect as suggesting a set of rules they should agree to follow if they still want to be accepted as an anarchist. For a lot of anarchist circles, the transcendent element is something like the ideal anarchist society. This is why you might hear people talking about creating the society you want to live in, in the here and now, judging people's actions based on the future imagined utopia, for all that it can be optimistic, hopeful and galvanising, pushes us towards dogmatic ideologies and nurtures distrust, rigidity and simplicity in the way we think about ethical behaviour. We'll call this the problem of normativity. These ethical frameworks also rely on the somewhat fixed and essentialist assumptions about ethical subjectivity. The idea of subjectivity looks at how much control we have over our actions or whether there is even a we or an I when it comes to making choices. Western liberal subjectivity imagines that we are all individuals with complete autonomy, that we behave predictably and rationally. This way of understanding ourselves is important for a lot of moral philosophy because It focuses attention on what the right choice is is in a particular situation and therefore who can be blamed or punished for making bad choices. These philosophies don't often like to consider the way the world controls choices and the way we are given paths to walk before we're even aware we have made a choice. Transcendent philosophies, ones which have a set of fixed principles or rules, automatically measure people against these rules and always empower the people who are either righteous or in charge of enforcing the rules or perhaps rarely both. Let me give you a few more examples. This problem of normativity was under discussion at least as far back as Emma Goldman who refused to be told that real anarchists don't dance. More recently it has been known under different names. In 2009, in the aftermath of the Seattle protests, Sasha Kay talked about anarcho-purism as, and I quote, a morality that tries to keep anarchism pure and separate from certain tactics or from working with certain groups for the sake of purity. It's a system of judgment whereby activists judge themselves and others to be true anarchists on the basis of a rigid set of qualities or behaviours they exhibit. 
More recently, again in Seattle, Francis Lee comments, I quote again, There is an underlying current of fear in my activist communities. It is the fear of appearing impure. Social death follows when being labelled a bad activist or simply problematic enough times. They also talk about rejecting the label activist altogether, along with the practices which activist communities adopt to police themselves, competing for purity, valuing people for how radical or risk-taking they are, and dismissing people for not knowing enough or not having read the sacred texts of feminism, post-colonialism, anarchism, etc., or calling out culture. And indeed, not recognising people at all if they aren't visibly anarchists. Anarchopurism, then, is the result of drawing and defining lines of belonging. This anarchism is, to use a technical term, a system of signification. Revolutionary value is attached to some actions and not to others, some performances and not others, some characteristics and not others. The anarchist search for purity or strict definitions means selecting some people, theories or lifestyles and rejecting others. Whilst this kind of gatekeeping is somewhat inevitable, when taken this far, it winds up excluding the uncomfortable or ill-fitting anarchists from communities or the literally canon. The Invisible Committee put this very clearly. Since the catastrophic defeat of the 1970s, the moral question of radicality has gradually replaced the strategic question of revolution. That is, revolution has suffered the same fate as everything else in those decades. It has been privatised. It has become an opportunity for personal validation, with radicality as the standard of evaluation. What happens instead is that a form is extracted from each revolutionary act. Here, they're critiquing the idea that an action is measured by its radicalness, almost like a point-scoring system where one gets credits for certain actions. This kind of radicalism has become a rigid value system or a system of judgment. So what is to be done with this problem? I've already said that I don't think blueprint approaches are enough to plaster over this. In fact, I think we need a total rethink of where we get our ethics from and how they work. I argue that this is something anarchism needs to take seriously, especially as post-structuralist critiques around power and gender gain more ground in our general ways of understanding the social world. The ethics I want to propose are based on imminence. What is imminence? It simply means that there is nothing external, nothing with higher authority than the relations here and now, and the specific brand of imminence that also stipulates that we are all one. The distinction between transcendent and imminent ethics comes first from Spinoza, a 17th century philosopher. For him, transcendence and the judgment that flows from it harms us because it is in fact what precludes the possibility for new ways of being to emerge. In the words of Gilles Deleuze, Spinoza doesn't make up a morality for a simple reason. He never asks what we do. He always asks what are we capable of, what is in our power. Ethics is a problem of power, never a problem of duty. This problem of power is best understood by thinking about where moral authority comes from. For transcendent systems, there is always something with higher authority which dictates right and wrong. This is the something external of transcendent philosophy. If we use imminent ethics, there is no higher authority. We just have the world we are in and the world we make. Often it is argued that if there is no external grounding for ethics, then we end up with a dangerous relativism in a situation where everything goes, which is the exact type of binary thinking I'm arguing against. Ways of being with each other do not have to rely on the binary between coercive moral laws and a Hobbesian state of nature where everyone fights everyone. In fact, Spinoza's ethics suggest there is another option, 
of relational grounded ethics of care and they have their own normativity which does not rely on shoulds, policing or issuing rules. These ways of being and doing are collective, joyful and increase our capacity, our individual and collective power in the world, rather than tell us what we should do. What justifies whether an action is good is whether it increases our collective power and joy. Unfortunately, I cannot go into too much detail here and define all the Spinoza's terms, such as joy, collective power. But for the philosophy nerds out there, I am drawing heavily on Deleuze, Guattari, Spinoza and Rosie Bradotti. And I want to suggest the idea that anarchist ethics are ones that embrace flexibility, uncertainty and are always redefining what it means to be an anarchist. This is not something new, and in fact, I would say that this happens all the time in anarchist circles. People are always resisting the status quo, always pushing the limits of radicalism, always experimenting and reinventing tactics and ways of doing things. And it's a matter of embracing this rather than trying to pin down anarchism as an ideology or a goal-oriented political project. What is transformative in one context might be stifling in another. And doing anarchism is about affirming actions and increasing each other's capacity to act and change things. This doesn't mean that anything goes, but that we as a collective decide what goes here and now and we do not assume that it is universal. This is a departure from traditional morality, but I argue a necessary one to allow for the transformative potential of communities to emerge. This kind of ethical subjectivity resembles Cordova's in the essay The We and the I, where they recognise the embeddedness of human beings in their social groups and their environment, emphasising that ethics is doing together. Finally, these relational ethics of care are also joyful. Carla Bergman and Nick Montgomery say this very nicely in their book Joyful Militancy. And I'm going to finish with this quote. Joy is the growth of people's capacity to do and feel new things in ways that can break the dependence on happiness. This feeling of the power to change one's life and circumstances is at the core of collective resistance. Thank you very much for listening. If anybody wants to get in touch, please contact the ARG uh, and they can forward me the email or you can email me on the Anarchist Studies Network conference email and uh, we'll get it. I'm really happy to continue that conversation with anybody who is interested. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.